Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm very honored to have Kent Bassett, who's a filmmaker and pain recovery coach. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we, um, Kent, and we're gonna talk about this as we go, was the director of the film, This Might Hurt, which probably lots of people on the channel know about and probably have seen. Um, but that was very involved in terms of kind of like a radical mind body approach involving, um, Dr. Schubiner's work, which is wonderful. And we, we were connected. That was probably like a year and a half ago, I want to say, Hey, um, and I did, I was on like that panel with, uh, yourself and Dr. Schubiner, but we reconnected. And so, you know, today, Kent, I was really hoping to really learn about you, right? Like about your story with, with pain and symptoms, uh, maybe talk a little bit about the film, this might hurt and talk about your pain recovery coaching practice. Awesome. So, yeah. So maybe to start off, do you mind sharing a little bit about your own journey in recovery with chronic pain? Yeah. Mine started when I was 22 years old. I was in college and I developed a debilitating, like burning pain on the top part of my arm. It started here. Yeah. And I thought it was from going too hard at the gym. I was like lifting these 35 pound weights that for me, I'm a, I have a small build. So that for me, that was a lot of weight. And I could yeah. see the tendons in my, like near my bicep, sort of like sticking through my skin, almost like with strain. And I was like, Ooh, that might've been too much weight. And then I got that pain and the burning. Okay. And then I, I got more concerned when it spread, it spread to the underside of my forearm. And then it went to the other arm, like a couple of days later. Oh, and, okay. um, I had a roommate who had had very similar symptoms. She was a piano player, like a devoted, like piano player doing it six hours a day. And she had been basically disabled with arm pain for like the prior six months and would lay on the couch and like ice her arms. And so I started to get concerned that I might've had something similar to her. And I asked her all about her syndrome and she told me and said, be careful with your arms. Like it can really be a problem. And um, I went to see a doctor. The doctors at uh, Swarthmore College, that's where I was in school, they, you know, they told me I had repetitive strain injury and tendinitis and that I should be really careful with my arms. And they prescribed physical therapy, which I couldn't do because I had Kaiser health insurance, but I wasn't in California where my health insurance was. So it was the messed up health system in the US. So I couldn't do physical therapy though it was prescribed. So instead they gave me Vicodin, which I could get. Uh, and I took the Vicodin, it didn't, didn't help. Uh, I honestly found a, a beer, a, you know, like <laughs> drinking a beer was more pain relief than I'd taken a Vicodin. So mm -hmm. thankfully other people have a different experience and can be dangerous to get hooked on opioids, obviously, as we all know now. Right. Um, and then I, my pain got steadily worse and I couldn't type papers without feeling pain. I couldn't play guitar without feeling pain. And every time I felt pain, I thought, oh, I need to rest my arms. This could be dangerous as my doctors seem to be telling me. And one of my doctors even said like, you may never be able to hold down a job where you use your arms a lot. <laughs> so there was like, there was a lot of like fear enticing narrative being placed on this, hey? Yeah. And it didn't help that I had a sort of probably a natural hypervigilant attitude towards this, towards the pain. And um, so then I decided to just take a semester off. I, so I basically dropped out of college. Uh, this is my, in my senior year and just to rest my arms and to not like force something that wasn't really working so well. So uh, I did that. I ended up like dictating all my papers to my mother, which was a whole ordeal, not fun. I don't recommend that. Okay. Um, and <laughs> was able to finish my coursework and kept seeing doctors. And I just saw all these doctors and surgeons and, you know, internal medicine doctors and, different ones. And none of them really made much sense of what I was going through. One doctor said I should eat more. That was his prescription. And then my mom was like, you got to eat, make sure you eat. You know, I'm just oh, a thin oh. person. I, it wasn't, it was totally unrelated to how much calories I was consuming, but yeah. I tried that for a while. And 
uh, you know, I saw a surgeon, I was hoping he might operate, but he didn't think it was a good idea. Then I saw a premier arm surgeon in New York City who had invented new kinds of surgeries on the hand. And he, he was really a helpful person in that he said, there's no diagnostic box for what you have. It's diffuse pain. It's all through your arms and in both arms. There's nowhere he could operate that would make sense uh, to relieve pain. And so he said, you know, we don't we don't really have any way to help you. We don't even know what you have. I mean, he said there's no diagnosis really for what you have. And he told me he sees people like me every month from the school year, the, the Juilliard School of Music. And he's not sure what to do about that. And so that really sent me reeling and thinking, you know, mainstream allopathic medicine didn't really have an answer for the chronic pain I was dealing with. And um, I was resistant to this, but I started to look into alternative medicine, which I was very skeptical of, but I felt I didn't have a choice. I read Andrew Weil's book, uh, Spontaneous Healing. And in that book, he talks about John Sarno and how John Sarno helped somebody with back and leg pain. And my mind was like, okay, leg pain, arm pain, limbs you know there's maybe a connection here close, <laughs> close, enough. Noble. Hmm? close enough yeah right i'll take it <laughs> what i was so desperate and so i went to barnes and noble i read the mind body prescription with the, which they had this is in 2004 and uh back when the bookstores there are lots of bookstores around i guess bookstores are coming back now but uh so i read the book and i was just immediately a light bulb went off you know the, the way he talks about it was so compelling and clear to me, he talks about how the body has evolved for millions of years to heal from injuries. And that if I, you know, if I injured my arms while lifting weights, it would heal. You know, that if you break the biggest bone in your body, it heals within months. So, you know, I'd had almost a year of pain at this point from a soft tissue injury, supposedly. And yeah. it didn't make sense. Soft tissue injuries heal within weeks. And yeah. so I took that in and he, he talks about how the brain can basically sustain pain in the absence of an injury because of anxiety, because of stressors. And that if you sort of look at those stressors and you, you understand the pain response is coming from the brain, you can recover. And uh, I like, <laughs> this is kind of silly, but that night, you know, he talks a lot about the unconscious mind. He had a very a Freudian emphasis, which has yeah. then you know there's lots of people who do this work now and they often say nothing about freud they say nothing about the psychoanalytic psychoanalytic history of the unconscious yeah um but at that time i really took that idea to heart too and so i i was like i'm gonna go to sleep tonight i'm gonna do battle with my unconscious that was my understanding that you do battle with your unconscious yeah and i'm going to overcome my pain and i went to bed i woke up the next morning and i was able to start typing on my computer and I felt a little bit of pain come up and then I was like, pain, go away. I don't need this warning system. Yeah. And then my, the pain dissipated on the spot. It just like, wow. I just, in a moment I was like, oh my God, yeah. you know, this thing that had felt so involuntary, so impossible to influence, suddenly I could have some influence. It's not like I could control it, but yeah. I could, get in there, I could see how dynamic it was and how my level of fear like might determine how much pain I was having. Of course, my mom was like, don't type. What are you doing? You're going to damage your arm, yeah. you know? And, <laughs> and so yeah. I had to be like, mom, I'm fine. I'm going to be fine. You know, like, don't worry about me. And but so that, I, I just immediately latched onto this. And that's not the case for so many people. Many people wrestle with skepticism and doubt for yeah. months or even years. But I was fortunate in that I just it just immediately made sense and nothing else made sense. I was 22. It made no sense that I damaged my arms forever, you know, at that age. And um, and it, yet the doctors I was seeing were warning me that's exactly what I might have done. And so something didn't compute until I read uh, the mind body prescription. Yeah. And that's a pretty, truly like a, a miraculous moment. Um, yeah. You, like, you really did. And, and some people have that experience where they latch on like, you know, they're they're like, this makes sense. And I think even with this approach now since since sarno we we just know so much more about the brain and about the nervous system and and how all of this functions and it, it's really escalated even like our understanding of like the pain science and but it's it's amazing that you like came to this approach you read the book and it seemed like you were fairly bought in 
like once you read it. And yeah, it and I, you know, my story is inspiring in some ways and can be really frustrating to people in other ways because I work with clients, you know, who they've totally bought in and they still have just as much pain as before they bought in, right? So sometimes that helps the pain go away. Sometimes it makes no difference, but that doesn't mean the treatment is any less helpful for people. I always like to mention that because, you know, it can be like, oh, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you're so lucky. Like, what about me? <laughs> well, I'm still in pain, even though I accept all these ideas. So, Yeah, I think it's an important point to hit on because um, people get frustrated. And yeah. it's, I, I feel like I say this every interview I have, you know, different things work for different people. And yeah. it's, it's important we know that because people take this as like this strict prescription that they need to follow and they'll just go through the motions and everything will get better. And sometimes the stars align, even when I'm working with someone and it just it lines up, right? Like thing after thing that we do, it just lines up perfectly with everything we're reducing. But as you and I know, sometimes it takes that exploration. It takes like exploring different things, playing around with different things doing different emotional work. Sometimes, of course, it's trauma work for people, but you know, you're right about that in, in the sense that it, it is different because everyone's brain and nervous system is different. Um, yeah. 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 And I, I always emphasize for people when I'm working with people is it's like, if you really let this knowledge sink in on a deep level that like the body for, for if you've had an assessment and it's been determined that this symptom is re, is caused by mind body that means there's no damage in your body so that pain is not a sign of damage and so i don't know there's still a way you can at least release from fear even if you still have the pain you can always remind yourself this pain is not a sign of damage it's not a threat i'm yeah. safe i'm okay and that is in and of itself that can be life-changing even if you're still in a lot of pain you know, just not to have that additional fear that like I'm dying or my body's disintegrating or I'm, you know, I'm going to keep losing my abilities permanently. The sense of the permanent change. That's what I was really focused on when I had arm pain. I was like, my arms might be permanently <laughs> damaged. Yeah. And like, yeah. what am I going to do, you know, if I can't use my arms? And so even if I, my pain hadn't gone away, I think just knowing my arms were healthy, that I didn't need to be afraid of using them. I could return to all my activities, you know, and whether I have pain or not, it's not so important as I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that because it's, it needs to be part of everyone's treatment. Like everyone needs to change their thoughts and beliefs about the pain or symptom they're experiencing because it doesn't matter like all the other work that we might do after that really doesn't even dent anything it doesn't chip away at anything if they if there's still a belief like you know my my body's permanently damaged in some way or and it's just going to get worse and i think about your story um it reminds me of myself i remember I, I had a doctor once tell me that um my nerves were hypersensitive and I better get used to being in pain. Like this is the narrative that I'm like being given. And you're right. You, you almost need to do that, the, that change in thoughts and beliefs so consistently because you've been told something completely different by so many other doctors that you met with, met with. Yeah. The nocebo effect is so powerful. This, this negative expectation you can, you can be programmed by other people, by your clinicians or by yourself to just, expect things to get worse or to assume your body's damaged and it can be really harmful and it can keep people stuck for a while if those beliefs aren't explored you know it's not that you have to some people think oh i have to accept mind body and it's more just that you need to uh be open-minded and be really skeptical even of your own fixed set fixed beliefs around the body being damaged um, because once you start paying close attention you realize that if you have a mind body you know, diagnosis, then then these beliefs can really start to slough off. It can sort of just fall away once you really examine them, this beliefs, meaning the beliefs that your body's damaged. It won't hold up to examination once you have this mind body science and the pain neuroscience understood well. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, from there, like you kind of had this moment where you're typing and and it kind of dissipates 
like what happened from there? And now I'm curious of, of how it kind of played <laughs> out after that. Yeah, I had what I, I I think of this as just as important of a light bulb experience because the pain left my arms and then it went up into my shoulder where I had had no pain and no symptoms. I went to the other shoulder. <laughs> it's just yeah. I was like, go away, pain. I know you're I know there's no damage there. And then I was like, cool. What about this shoulder? Yeah. It's like watching that. Then I had head pain, chest pain, uh, neck pain. And so the, the symptoms just started moving around. One day I was riding my bicycle up a hill and I got like, I was really exerting myself and suddenly I had like this really intense distortion in an ear. I was like, what is this? I started to get worried. And then I really remembered, oh, Dr. Sarno had a chapter on tinnitus, which yeah. is like distortion or ringing in the ears. Yeah. And this was a very, it was, sometimes tinnitus can be very mild, but this was a kind where like, I couldn't hear what people were saying. like. It only lasted for two days, but it was very like disturbing to have that happen, like not being able to hear without, you know, disturbance and distortion. And then I read the book and I just was lucky. I could just say, hey, I know there's nothing wrong with my ear, like make this symptom go away. And then my mind would switch it off. Yeah. But it really was an education just to watch. It felt like my mind was going through Sarno's list of mind body symptoms and like checking them off one by one. Of course, I didn't get half of them, but yeah. it was pretty. Uh, eye-opening and that was like additional confirmation you know that that like there was never really anything wrong with my arms if if the pain could just suddenly appear in other places for no reason without any injury and so um that was a really powerful education in the mind-body connection and what they call the symptom imperative right this technical term we use for when people have enough of a stress level or enough childhood trauma that hasn't been processed or whatever it is enough fear their their net guilt anxiety and fear are high enough that you will get a symptom somewhere uh, yeah. until you deal with these underlying concerns and so i know i did a lot of journaling emotional journaling at the time i wasn't working with the practitioner then and i was able to make all those problems go away over over a few months and it wasn't until years later I did therapy and I, I went back and I did like experiential, um, intensive, short term dynamic psychotherapy with yeah. a few practitioners, largely to deal with anxiety, uh, anxiety and like avoidance, you know, like basically just working on myself. Um, I didn't have like an acute crisis of any kind, but I just I just realized and maybe we'll come back to this when I was filming with Howard Schubiner that this type of therapy can be so much more powerful than just eliminating pain, right? It can yeah. give you insight. It can help you with your relationships. It can help you feel your emotions more fully. It can do all this great work in terms of just improving your life. And so uh, I did do that eventually, but it wasn't, wow. it wasn't when I had pain. Yeah. Yeah. I've done over kind of a number of years and you're right. I liked what you said there. And I think it's hard for people to wrap their mind around it when like the pain or symptom you're dealing with is the the biggest thing in your life right like it's so debilitating it's all consuming it's like the one thing we want to go away at all costs and i regardless of what techniques you're using like this mind body approach it really can be very life-changing not even including the pain or symptoms um like i think even for myself similar to yourself like it's of course, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that I don't have chronic pain anymore. But there was so much else that I learned. There was so much else that I gained from doing this work. And um, I, I think it's important people know that, that it's not just yeah. about making the pain or symptom go away. Uh, and a lot of times it does take working through past things. It does take lifestyle changes. Um, it does thing, take things to kind of regulate us. Um, and, and that causes our life to change and, and not just for the pain and symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. I consider my life like really transformed since, since, I mean, that was 20 years ago, but, uh, you know, since I had the pain, yeah, Howard Schubiner used to always talk about this, that the pain is a message, you know, and, and Dr. Sarno would talk about this. The pain is a message. It's a message. The body talks to you and it doesn't know how to use language or English. <laughs> It just, it talks to you in pain or it talks to you in anxiety or it talks to you in other body sensations and you have to decipher it and interpret it. And the medical system 
is usually not a good help for that. And yeah. rather, you know, doing things like journaling, reflecting, working with the psychotherapist, working with a coach, working with the meditation teacher. These are people who are good at translating non-medical difficulties, pain, anxiety, fatigue, things that doctors can't help you with. There are other group of a whole other group of practitioners that are really skilled at helping. Um, and you can also do the work yourself. But um, I'm losing my train of thought. But you know, basically, like, yeah, I found that that the pain is a message, right? And so the, so for me, I had a real like message from my pain. I think what I came to realize is that my life was out of balance, that I was really focused. I was I was an idealistic 22 year old. I was a hyper political person and really just had all my focus outwardly around changing the world, making the world a better place, fighting yeah. for social justice, fighting political fights. Um, I still care about doing that, but I care about it in a more balanced way where I'm also valuing my own personal development, my own career trajectory, what's coming from inside me, what do I want, not just responding to the cries of the world, which are, you know, I, I had so much compassion and desire to change the world that I was not paying attention to my own needs. And so the pain was a wake up call for me. And I really, I shifted, I shifted my life trajectory. You know, I decided to go and work and become a filmmaker after this episode of pain and mm -hmm. get really more interested in the arts. And I still worked on films that I hoped would make a positive impact on the world, but mm -hmm. I didn't like, choose a career that's like full-time activism which is maybe what i was going to do otherwise and yeah. not that there's anything wrong with that career choice but i think it wasn't the right one for me at that time yeah yeah and it, it, it truly was life-changing for you right like yeah it changed the the way that you went about living um and i think so many people you know when we actually start to listen and figure that out like there's so much we can learn Right? like these these symptoms are these like meaningful messages that that we're being given we're just we're misunderstanding them a lot of the time um, and so many find that their life is out of balance in some capacity like that's such a common one um i find a lot of people uh you've probably seen this too but a lot of people with with mind body issues with neuroplastic pain uh we can be we can be an intense group of people <laughs> <laughs> you can you can be a little bit intense and Inten us <laughs> no way you know i i my partner tells me this all the time i've i've lowered the intensity over over the years but still have spikes now and then but it's uh it reminds when you were talking about um you know kind of like your political views and how you wanted to change the world and you get so invested in that. I remember being in my my like undergrad in social work and being like, I'm gonna change the world. Like I need to like <laughs> do all these things and getting so intense. And it, you know, intense is just a different word for dysregulated, right? Like you get so dysregulated uh, because you know the passion gets past the point that we can kind of tolerate. But I I relate to that too. And it, it kind of segs segues into the the films and I I'm of the belief that uh, your films have changed the world. And I know um, people are probably interested to hear about the film, This Might Hurt. And so can you tell us a bit about, you know, what, what the film is about, like This Might Hurt and maybe when it came out and, and when this all came about, because I know you connected with Dr. Schubiner and worked with him very personally on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Starting in 2011, I started working on a project. I knew the title at the beginning, this might hurt. And it was going to be about people with chronic pain. And it was going to look at the John Sarno treatment, the mind body treatment for the pain. And I was really curious, you know, I, I, this was before there had been so much research uh, that we have today. And there was less neuroscience research or less clarity around this. And so it was a much more exploratory kind of a thing. Like, can this really help other people? I had this hunch that this was a treatment that was relevant not just for back pain, not just for migraine headaches, but for 30 different really common uh, physical complaints that people have and people spend yeah. so much money on and you know still are suffering years later. I was like, I think this mind-body treatment might be relevant for them. 
but I didn't know. And so uh, I started talking to Dr. Sarno. I eventually got led that that eventually led to talking with Dr. Howard Schubiner, uh, who is a newer generation of doctors following in Sarno's footsteps. And he was really adding things like um, meditation. And he was teaching a course and um, had his book Unlearn Your Pain. And I read through that and spoke with him on the phone. And he was he was just really easy to talk to. And I immediately felt a rapport with. Dr. Schubiner, you know, and we talked about, could we do a, a documentary class? And he, you know, he really went out of his way and, and opened up his private practice for me to uh, film with. He, he created a wow. all documentary class. All the patients who he was sifting through would be put into this class, like if they were open to being filmed. And then I met with some of them before they even met him. I flew out there, um, hired local crew and, um, you know, it was like, this is why I want to make the film. It's because I had chronic pain and recovered using this uh, treatment and think it might be relevant for others. And people wanted to share their stories because they really had the sense that they had suffered enough. They had been through so many doctors, so many treatments, tried like 10 different medications, you know, had had surgeries, multiple surgeries they have been through the ringer and they, they, they suspected this might be something very different. And so they decided, yeah, I'll, I'll be a part of this film and with the hope that it will help others, or at least shed light on this topic, shed light on the, the plight of people with chronic pain who are often on disability, stuck in their homes, unable to participate in society. They're often forgotten about. And so they wanted to bring attention just to chronic pain patients in and of themselves. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, I had a partner, a filmmaking partner, Marion Cunningham, who yeah. came on shortly after we did a, the first batch of filming and she was instrumental in trying to, in figuring out how to edit the film and do some, um, filming of new material so that the film was really told through the eyes of people in pain. And, um, we had to re-interview Howard many, many times because these ideas are so, they can be so dry. They can be so uh, like not obvious what they mean. You say the word anxiety. What does anxiety mean? It has a hundred different definitions. Or you say mind body. What does it mean exactly? And yeah. so we just were, and, and Howard is always refining his way of explaining things. And each time we interviewed him, we'd get like a really juicy way of explaining it clearly and succinctly. So it has to be succinct to fit into an 80 minute film, right? And so we did a lot of editing. We probably did two years of editing on this film. We made it over seven years and um, and we wanted to make sure that the effect for people was lasting. And so we checked in with them five years later saying, asking them, did this help you? How much did it help you? Are you still, you know, out of pain? Did your pain come back? Did it move to a different part of your body? Because that's what so many doctors think if they're, you know, if they're a back doctor and they give someone an injection, their back pain goes away. It's like, great. But then we talked about the symptom imperative, right? It's like, yeah they don't have pain in their back anymore, but their migraines are worse, or they start to have fibromyalgia. And so we were really looking at the whole person, the whole, their whole experience and saying, was this a treatment useful for you? Did it make a difference? And the result, you can find out the result by watching the film. Uh, and um, yeah, we're really proud of it, Mary and I. I mean, we worked on it for so long and it was one of these films that was very hard to fund. There's no corporate sponsors. <laughs> yeah. There's no pharmaceutical companies that wanted to fund our film, unlike the chronic film, chronic pain film that aired on Discovery, which is completely underwritten by a pharmaceutical company. Our film is grassroots, homemade, two people, me and Marion basically, yeah. you know, had some help from others, but we basically did it on our own. Our moms gave us loans <laughs> to finish the film. And we had help from the community who supported our Kickstarter campaign. And wow. so, yeah, I, I really uh, would suggest people check it out. This might hurt Um We do screenings. We're still doing an impact campaign. I could go on and on. Anyway, that's sort of, yeah. I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's just, a, it's amazing to hear the whole story. I know we've talked about it and, and I've seen the film. It's, it's a great film. Um, oh, thank you. Really, yeah, like truly, it, it really gives a, an understanding. And I think it's, you're right. It's one of those films where, you know, 
I imagine other films you can you can find sponsors, you can find people to to fund this, but it was really a a, a project of passion from the sounds of it on your end, right? Where you knew, like you knew, like it, that it helped you, and you really and I truly, really, I think that film has probably helped so many people. Um, I know lots of people have seen it who've who've had a completely different outlook on their pain and, and really changed things. So. I think it's amazing that that you were able to complete that and that you still kind of promote it and um and get the word out there about that yeah oh, thank you thank you so much yeah but i'll put all the links below so if people want to check that out uh, i'll include that in the description below but i know kent it it led into now you're doing some pain recovery coaching yes um, yeah and so tell me tell me a bit about your practice in terms of you know what it kind of looks like what approaches you tend to pull from uh give me a bit of an understanding about that yeah i uh i've completed train so you know after working for a decade on this film about pain seven years of production three years doing our impact campaign you would think i would be like done with pain and done with like a film mm -hmm. about anxiety that took up my whole life for years and years but no i'm like after we finished the film, I really did think I was going to be done because it really was a large chunk of my life. But I, I found in distributing the film that I was even more compelled than ever, you know, like to have a finished film and to see the impact on people. And then honestly, re, um, attending the kind of webinars we would do after the screenings with you and Howard and just finding every time Howard would speak about these issues, he would bring a different nuance. He would, he would other people who had had symptoms like long COVID arrived on the scene, right? Uh, yeah. A new ailment, except it's very similar to so many ailments that are considered mind-body in nature. And we, keep, we don't need to get into long COVID right now, but yeah. I just found that uh, the mind-body thing is even bigger than I realized when I was making the film and, and fascinating and always evolving. And so I realized I wanted to continue to still be part of this world. And I wanted to directly help people. I, th I realized like I was kind of jealous of the people who, um, you know, of the practitioners and people would watch our film and then find these practitioners and then have these incredible healing journeys with working one on one or in groups of people. And I realized like, oh, I'm curious to be a part of that and learn how to help people directly. And uh, I did that. I did training with um, Dr. Schubiner and Hal Greenham. I did training with Mark Lumley used, uh, around emotional awareness and expression therapy. I've done training on pain reprocessing therapy. And I worked for um, one of these app-based healing programs teaching somatic tracking for a year. And I just immediately found that I really loved doing the work. I felt like uh, I could see changes in people happening. I could sense their feeling that they were being understood and helped in a way that was um, specific to my knowledge and my background. I have a lot of background in mindfulness. We didn't get into that, but I've done a lot of deep practice in um, the Vipassana tradition. And I find that the kind of presence you can bring for another person when you've done like deep meditative work can be just healing in and of itself. The, the depth of compassion and mindfulness that you can guide other people towards feeling for themselves can make an enormous difference. And that's something that I feel like I done <laughs> just so much training around before starting to do this work and found that it really carried over in such a nice way um, and easily, you know, it easily, it easily transfers to people with chronic pain because they really need self-compassion. They need to, to experience compassion for others and to be open to their internal experience. And that's what the, the mindfulness training is all about. So I, I, I work with mindfulness. I work with pain reprocessing therapy. I also work with some with nonviolent communication. So a lot of people come in and they have conflicts, they have ongoing conflicts that are driving their pain response, their anxiety response. And how do you deal with it? How do you, I don't know about other people, but I grew up in a family where we all blamed each other and raged at each other when we had a conflict. We didn't know how to deal with conflict. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole skill. How do you deal with conflict without exacerbating your own pain or someone else's pain? And so um, I've done some training around that. I'm not an official teacher of nonviolent communication, but I've done enough training that I feel like I can give people the base, the basics. And so anyway, that's, those are some of my emphases when I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. Wow. And you've done a lot of training. That, that was, <laughs> that's great. Um, 
I uh, personally myself, I love my tradings. I feel like I'm just like constantly <laughs> doing a new trading because uh, it's fascinating learning about this stuff. But uh, it sounds sounds like Kent, your your practice is really well rounded, um, which is great. Like you you pull from so many different things to to support people, which is amazing. Oh, thank and you. So, you know what I'll what I'll do is I'll include your links and uh, a bit of a description about Kent in, in the in the description below this video, so people could definitely check out your information. I'll I'll put the links for this might hurt as well, um, so people can attend the screening or uh, buy the film to watch, which is a which is a great film as well. So I, I want to thank you so much for, for being on the channel and, and spending the time with me today. Uh, I really appreciate it. I feel like I haven't seen you when well, we're not in person, but virtually I haven't seen you in probably like a year and a half. So it's been a while I know. Since, since we connected last time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's been great to reconnect. And thanks so much for the conversation. And I always enjoy talking about this stuff. So appreciate yeah. you. Yeah, thanks so much. And for everyone uh, out there watching, like, please put your questions or comments down below and, and I'll be sure to, to answer them.